You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Live from Washington, D.C., the Federal Judicial Center and the U.S. Sentencing Commission present Sentencing and Guidelines, Basic Application. Here is your moderator for today's program, Nancy Filsu. Hello. As you just heard, I'm Nancy Filsuf, and I'm a Senior Education Specialist for the Federal Judicial Center. Welcome to this afternoon's broadcast on Sentencing and Guidelines Basic Application. Uh, this is actually a third in the series of broadcasts on Sentencing and Guidelines that has been presented by the Federal Judicial Center in partnership with the United States Sentencing Commission. Let me tell you a little bit about this broadcast. We're going to be um, broadcasting for approximately two hours and at that midpoint, we'll probably have a five-minute break. Now, let me tell you more about the broadcast. What, we've, what we're going to do is a major portion of the broadcast, we are going to be showing a videotape of a training program that the United States Sentencing Commission uh, presented in Clearwater, Florida, not too long ago on basic applications. So what we have done is we have divided this tape into four segments. And in between the segments, we have experts from the Sentencing Commission that we will introduce to you in a few minutes. And they will provide commentary on the segments, and also they will answer your questions that you will be faxing in um, during the pro program broadcast. I'll give you the fax number in just a few minutes. Also, I want to show you that we have some information that you can find about the broadcast on the Federal Judicial Center DCN website. And there's a lot of very good information about the Sentencing Commission in here. So I really urge you to get this information if you haven't already done so. Also in this packet, you will notice that we have provided for your convenience a fax form that you can use when you are faxing in your questions to us. Now before I forget, let me give you the fax number. It's 1-800-488-0397. 1-800-488-0397. Also, this program has been approved for Continuing Legal Education Credit, or CLE, and you can find out how to apply for this credit also by going to the Federal Judicial Center DCN website. I believe I'm finished with my announcements. What I'd like to do is to introduce to you my colleagues from the Sentencing Commission. First of all, we have Rusty Burrows, who is a principal advisor in the Commission, and we also have Rachel Pierce, who is an Education and Sentencing Practice Specialist. And both are from the Office of the Education and Sentencing Practice. Well, Rusty and um, Rachel, welcome to the program. I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you so much, Nancy. And I know that you do have some comments that you want to provide to us before we start the first segment. So, Rachel, why don't you start first? Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Sentencing Commission, I'd like to welcome you to Sentencing and Guidelines Basic Application. Today, on the pre-recorded videotape, you will be seeing instruction from Andy Purdy in the Office of General Counsel, Frank Larry in the Office of Education and Sentencing Practice, and Rusty Burris. As, as Nancy mentioned earlier, this videotape was originally taped at the 8th Annual National Seminar on Sentencing Guidelines, which occurred in Clearwater, Florida in 1999. Rusty, would you like to tell us a little bit more about how the broadcast is going to go today? I'd be glad to. Uh, as you know from the title of our program today, the focus is on basic guidelines application. And we're going to do that by breaking it down into four segments. In the first segment, we're going to look at uh, some of the general application principles. We'll look at the Chapter 2 guidelines for offense, uh, offenses. We'll also look at the Chapter 3 adjustments. In our second segment, we'll look at criminal history determinations and also how to use the sentencing table in coming up with an appropriate guideline range. In the third segment, we'll look at relevant conduct. And then in the fourth segment, we'll look at multiple counts with just a brief uh, look at departures. Now, after segments one and three, uh, Rachel, you and I will be coming back to just make a few comments. Uh, after segments two and four, uh, we'll be coming back to take the uh, questions that the uh, viewers will be asking us. Uh, and in terms of the questions, you want to give them some further insight. Sure, Rusty. 
We would like to focus our questions today on questions that pertain to basic guideline application. However, if you have faxed in a question that we don't get to on our broadcast today, please feel free to call us on our helpline, which operates Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. The number for that is 202-502-4545. Let's go ahead and get started with the videotape and Frank Larry. Before we get started, just wanted to uh, make a couple of points about resources, you know, at the Sentencing Commission, about some of the things that you can uh, have access to. Now, I know the probation officers know a lot about our uh, helpline. We operate a helpline at the Sentencing Commission Monday through Friday from uh, 8.30 to 5 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. And I can tell you, if you call us, we'll do as much as we can to answer your questions. The other resource I'm going to point out is our website, www.ussc.gov. On our website, we have a training and education section where we put up a lot of training materials, a lot of training documents. We, we do our best to keep it current, and we're always looking for ideas, too, about our website. I know a lot of you out there are internet savvy, in which case, please, you know, call, you can call me because I'm sort of uh, overseeing our guideline and education section on the uh, internet, but it's turned into a very popular spot for people to go to for information. In terms of all you're going to hear today about how to apply the guidelines and how the guidelines work, everything is going to be moving toward this sentencing table. Just as a snapshot, you have the offense level running down this axis, top to bottom, and the criminal history category goes the other way. It goes horizontally, categories one through six. So when you end up with a, an offense level at a, let's say, a 10 and a category 1 criminal history, basically no criminal history, we're at a guideline range of 6 to 12 months. And that's basically what the court has to use, absent a departure up or down. Now, before we actually get into the sort of the, I call it sort of the guideline crunching, you know, all the numbers and everything, let's go talk about what we refer to as determining an appropriate sentence. And we talk about it in terms of a sort of like a two-step process. The first step being to determine the appropriate guideline range. And there's no substitute for that. You've got to go in, do the application, get the guideline range. But we're also going to ask you to do sort of a second step, and that is to make what we call this refined assessment. It could be that you know, there's a factor maybe the guidelines didn't take into account that might distinguish this case, take it out sort of the heartland of cases to make this case a little bit different that might justify, you know, um, a downward departure or possibly an upward departure. But we, we're asking you to sort of stand back and so that an appropriate sentence may be a sentence within the guideline range or it may be a departure because departures are part of the guideline system. They were intended to be part of the guideline system. We're not out telling everybody to just keep departing all the time from the guidelines. That's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is where there's a bona fide reason for departure, we're encouraging you to, to be mindful of this. Now, in 1984, when the Sentencing Reform Act was placed into law, it made sweeping changes to the way federal sentencing was done. And what we went to was a system of determinate sentencing basically doing away with parole. And as you know, there's no parole in the federal system anymore. But instead of, you know, the parole, the court actually can uh, impose periods of supervised release. It's similar to the parole, but under supervised release, if a, if a person violates the supervised release term, that person goes back to the judge under the current law, under the Sentencing Reform Act, as opposed to going back to the parole commission under the way the previous law worked. So you do have these terms of supervised release, which follow a person's imprisonment term. They do their prison term, potentially then come out on a period of supervised release. You have probation officers who, uh, who are responsible for supervising people. A significant reduction in good time under the Sentencing Reform Act. Under the old law, most prisoners were eligible for at least a third off. Usually they were eligible for parole after a third of their sentence. Under the Sentencing Reform Act, that was reduced to uh, 54 days a year after the first year. Also, the Sentencing Reform Act specifically provided for appeal of a sentence 
under 3742 of Title 18. You know, I showed you that guideline range. If the judge says, no, nah, I don't like that guideline range, I'm going to do an upward departure. And if that's the case, okay, and there's statutory room to do that upward departure, the defendant has the automatic, automatic right to appeal. If there's a downward departure from that guideline range, same thing with the government. The government has, the U.S. attorney has the uh, right to appeal that uh, sentence automatically. Uh, of course, you can always appeal an incorrect application of the guidelines. It was just basically wrong from the beginning, and uh, uh, either party can uh, make that uh, appeal. Uh, where there's no guideline and the sentence is plainly unreasonable can be a basis for an appeal as well. Well, we have about at least 80% or so of the, of the federal criminal violations covered by the guidelines. There's a few out there that are not. You probably won't see many of those. But the plainly unreasonable would be the standard for appeal in that situation. And, of course, if it was a, an out-and-out -out illegal sentence, which I dare say you very rarely see, but uh, that's another right to uh, an appeal. We have statistics uh, from 1997, in case you're curious about what actually the courts are doing in terms of uh, sentencing. If you look at 97, uh, this is based on four, uh, roughly 46,000 cases. Almost 68% of the time, uh, judges are sentencing within the guideline range. Above the guideline range, you know, these departures upward from the guideline range, 97.8%. And below the guideline range, these downward departures in 97 at 12.1%. 1998, there's an increase to 13.6%. And below the guideline range for substantial assistance is 5K1.1, which we're going to talk a little bit about later. Uh, for substantial assistance, uh, 97 number, 19.2%. The 98 number, 19.3%. So roughly the same. And that's been holding pretty steady the 5K1.1 rate over the past few years. Um, and the 98 case is based on more cases in 98, uh, almost 48,000 cases in 98. You know, with, with single count application, and we're going to start off with single counts later, we'll talk about multiple counts, but if you don't understand single count application, you will not understand multiple count application. One thing to keep in mind, uh, for, for you folks that haven't had experience with this, is that the statute always trumps the guidelines. So if you go through this process going down the table, across the table, and you come up with some range, and that range says 12 to 14 years, but the defendant's convicted of a count with a maximum statutory penalty of 10 years, the statute's going to trump the guidelines. This guy cannot get any more than 10 years. That will be the sentence. Or if you calculate a guideline range that says give the guy two to three years, but the individual's convicted of an offense with a mandatory minimum of five years, that defendant will get the mandatory minimum of five years. Again, the statute will trump the guidelines. So keep that in mind because uh, it can be quite significant as to the count that has been pled to, for instance, in a single count application, because you may come in having the statute trump what the guidelines have called for. In Chapter 2, as you're working your way down the table, you develop a base offense level, which is a starting point for coming down the table from the Chapter 2 guideline. You have specific offense characteristics uh, that talk about certain aspects of this particular offense, and if those characteristics are applicable, they will send you further down, sometimes back up the table. And you have in some of the Chapter 2 guidelines uh, what are called cross-references that basically say, okay, you've applied this Chapter 2 guideline and you came up with a number here, but the cross-reference may say, well, go over to another Chapter 2 guideline, apply that and see what that number is. And sometimes you're directed to use that other guideline if the number is higher, or you're directed to use that other guideline under certain circumstances instead of the one with which you had begun. Having completed the Chapter 2 calculations coming down the table, then you move to what we refer to sort of as generic guidelines in Chapter 3. Uh, there are adjustments that further affect this offense level, sending you further down or back up the table. These include victim-related adjustments, role in the offense adjustments, obstruction adjustments. Now, we're looking at single count application, so at this point we're not concerned with multiple counts, but in the sequence of guideline application, next would be the consideration of multiple counts of conviction, if you did have multiple counts. And then the final Chapter 3 adjustment is acceptance of responsibility. Of course, the question is, 
which chapter two guideline do you begin with? Uh, you've got a whole section of the guidelines manual there, chapter two. In fact, it's the bulk of the guidelines manual pretty much uh, that is chapter two. So how do you determine which particular guideline is going to be the chapter two guideline you will use? Well, that's in guideline 1B1.2. One means that you're in chapter one of the guidelines manual. B means you're in part B of chapter one. And then 1.2 is the specific guideline there. So obviously I'm now referring you back to chapter one. Well, chapter one is probably the most important chapter in the book for correctly applying chapters two, three, four, and then ultimately chapter five. So uh, there are a lot of things going on in chapter one that we will be referring to, uh, particularly this guideline and relevant conduct, which is also back in chapter one. When you're deciding which chapter two guideline you're gonna use, you use the one most applicable to the offense of conviction. And again, going back to some of the decisions early on the Sentencing Com Commission made in writing guidelines, uh, it was like, do we write these guidelines for an offensive conviction system? You know, it's what you're convicted of is going to dictate essentially what the sentence is going to be. Or is it more of a real offense sentencing system? You look at what really went on out there, regardless as to what they're convicted of, and then the sentence would really be driven by that. And the Sentencing Commission really has come up with what we sort of see as a hybrid system. Uh, but that hybrid system begins as an offensive conviction system. What the defendant is convicted of will dictate which chapter two guideline is going to be used. In your guidelines manual, back in Appendix A, we have what is called a statutory index. And the statutory index lists most of the codes that the Sentencing Commission sees being violated that result in convictions in the federal court. We have those codes listed. And then we list the chapter two guideline that we think should be the applicable guideline for that offense of conviction. Now, in our scenario, what was our defendant convicted of? What, what statutory section of law? 2113? Okay, and what was the subsection? A and D. Okay, now, if you go to the appendix A, you'll see that under 2113A, we have four potential chapter two guidelines listed. You know they're chapter two guidelines because they all begin with the number two. Now under 2113D, you see there's just one guideline listed there. And there has to be a decision as to which guideline is the most applicable guideline for your offensive conviction. If you were to look up those guideline sections that are listed back there, those chapter two guideline sections, you would see that they are the guidelines, 2B1.1, larceny guideline, the burglary guideline, the robbery guideline, and the extortion guideline. Those are the four potential guidelines. The commission says one of these probably will be your applicable guideline for this offense of conviction that we have in our scenario. The reason we have more than one guideline listed under 2113A is that if you read that section of law, 2113A, it says it's against the law to commit larceny or burglary or robbery or extortion involving a bank. So we're not really sure what that guy's convicted of on our end. Now, it's not going to be that complicated for you folks because you all have the charging instrument, the, the information or indictment that the individual has pled guilty to, and that will have the elements of the offense your defendant has pled guilty to. And so in that case, you look and see what the defendant was convicted of. So regardless as to what the facts surrounding this offense may look like, your, con your concern at this point is what was the defendant convicted of? And you say, well, the defendant was convicted of larceny. That's the offense of conviction. I'm reading the elements of 2113A. It's the offense of larceny. Now, it sure looked like a robbery, but that doesn't matter. In choosing the Chapter 2 guideline, you would go to the larceny guideline under that set of facts. Now, having discovered which guideline we're going to use, we go back to Chapter 2 to begin applying that Chapter 2 guideline. I think that you'll find the worksheets are a most helpful way, for those of you that have never applied the guidelines before, of making sure you don't miss a step in the application of the guidelines. It will send you through the sequential, correct sequential application of the guidelines, keeping you from missing any of the appropriate uh, guidelines or adjustments that need to be considered. Okay, the robbery guideline. Uh, the robbery guideline 2B3.1 is gonna be our applicable guideline for this offense conviction in this scenario. The robbery guideline is like, I would say, most of the guidelines in chapter two in that it has a set base offense level. This defendant is going to start at an offense level 20. You've looked at your sentencing table. This guy's down to the number 20 in that left-hand column at this point of guidelines application. But that's not the end of the calculations in Chapter 2 because then you have these specific offense characteristics, characteristics that will send you further down the table or, or for sometimes back up the table depending upon whether it's an aggravating or a mitigating characteristic. 
You'll see in the robbery guideline, if it's a financial institution or post office, you add two additional offense levels. Would that be applicable in our scenario here? Okay, so this guy's gone from a 20 to a 22. Uh, firearm, weapon, or threat of death, and that can be anywhere from two additional offense levels up to seven, depends upon type of weapon and the use made of that weapon. Okay, so the guidelines would have you add five additional offense levels as you're, if you're looking in your guidelines manual. See, this guy's going to pick up five more levels for, for the possession of the firearm. Uh, how about victim injury? There was a victim injured, and what was the degree of injury? Bodily injury. Now, of course, bodily injury, you know, you're saying, well, what is bodily injury? We know the person got pushed, they had this injury. What was the degree? Again, as you're applying these guidelines, the commission has, following the guideline itself, commentary that includes application notes. And there's a lot of definitions, a lot of definitions are contained there uh, to include what, what are definitions of injury. We send you back to somewhere else in the book to locate those. But definitions of, of injury, of weapon, other things that you will be considering in the application of the guidelines, we have definitions for those things. Uh, another just general point is you go through guidelines application, for instance here in chapter 2 and elsewhere, uh, the guideline application is cumulative. You started with the 20, and it was a bank, you added two levels, and there was a firearm possessed, you've added the five levels. In other words, it's a cumulative uh, application as you go through. However, within a subset, for instance, we looked at weaponry a while ago. Well, you may have the guy that goes in, you know, loaded for bear. He has the gun, he has the knife, he's dis discharging the gun, he's using the knife, and it's like, whoa, now did I give a seven plus a five plus a four or whatever? I mean, you're adding all those up. It is not cumulative within a subset. Within a subset, if more than one is applicable, as would be that set of facts, you would give the highest of those that are applicable. If more than one is applicable, as would say always be the case, if you discharge a firearm, obviously you possessed it if you discharged it, uh, you're not going to give the five for the possession and the seven for the discharge. You just give the higher or highest uh, as would be applicable if more than one uh, could be applied. We have a definition of loss that's the value of property taken damaged or destroyed. So depending upon what was taken, what was damaged, what was destroyed in this robbery, all that adds up and represents a loss figure. In our scenario at hand, we had uh, loss of uh, $18,000, that's more than $10,000, and picks up an additional offense level. And again, you'll notice that recovery doesn't make a difference. In other words, a guy, hey, I took $18,000, I'm going out the door, you got the die pack going off, this money's no good, I'm running. The defendant still has taken $18,000, even if recovered. Or if restitution had been paid, maybe they didn't, never recovered it, but the defendant's paid full restitution, still there was that amount that was taken under our definition of loss. The concern that we have here is on the cross-reference. Suddenly, you know, this defendant who was operating at offense level 32, you know, if, if a victim was murdered in this, in this robbery, then we would cross-reference you. We'd say, well, that 32 number, we're not going to use that. We're going to cross-reference over to the guideline for first-degree murder, and the offense level we're going to use instead is going to be 43. So we've jumped the guy from a 32 to 43. Now, the jury hasn't come back to make any finding that this guy was convicted of, of murder because he's not convicted of murder. If this guy's convicted of robbery, the maximum statutory penalty for armed robbery is 25 years. So the question is, is this going to be a guy whose sentence the commission feels is more appropriately down towards, say, one day of imprisonment or whose sentence more appropriately is up around 25 years of imprisonment? And to make that determination, the commission has you look at a number of factors as to what occurred in this offense. And again, not looking at it beyond a reasonable doubt, but once you're applying these guidelines, looking at it at a preponderance of evidence standard as has typically been used in sentencing. And the commission, by sending you on a cross-reference, even though we've cross-referenced you to the murder guideline and we're using the 43 if that cross-reference occurs, this defendant still is not looking at what the penalty would be for a murder, which is life. This defendant is still looking at a maximum of 25 years. Now, the 43 in the calculations, this guy's probably going to end up with a guideline range that's going to be in excess of 25 years, I dare say. But nonetheless, the maximum exposure of this defendant is 25 years. The statute will trump the guidelines. This is going to be one of the defendants who's going to get a sentence that's going to be right at 25 years. Now, the concern, of course, is does the commission think it's fair to bump this guy up closer to 25 years when he hasn't been convicted of the more serious offense of, of uh, murder? And I would have to say that, yes, the commission obviously has taken those things into consideration in formulating the guidelines in this fashion. Okay, now having completed your Chapter 2 calculations, coming up with a number, and you notice we're still on our worksheet A, 
on page uh, 48. We're about halfway down that worksheet. We have a 32 from our chapter 2 calculations. But then we go to these generic guidelines in chapter 3. Victim-related adjustments, role in the offense adjustments, obstruction adjustments, multiple counts, and acceptance of responsibility. These victim-related adjustments include hate crime motivation, for which three additional offense levels will be added, or vulnerable victim, for which two additional offense levels will be added, or if, if there are large numbers of multiple victims, uh, it's two additional levels on top of that other two for vulnerable victim. Official victim uh, is a three additional offense level increase, and if you have someone somehow associated with this offense that, that was a, an official or an official's family member or something, your antenna should go up. Uh, restraint of the victim is a two offense level increase, and if it's a terrorism offense, uh, we add 12 additional offense levels, and this guideline is somewhat unique, very unique for a chapter uh, three adjustment, uh, and that is it sets a floor, a floor of 32. In other words, by adding 12 levels, if you haven't gotten to the floor of 32, by adding 12 levels, you drop on down to a 32 on the sentencing table. This one also has the uniqueness of affecting your criminal history category. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, these Chapter 3 adjustments under Part A for victim-related adjustments, some obviously are used more often than others. The ones I'll just sort of point out that you are much more likely to see are vulnerable victim. Vulnerable victim comes up in a lot of fraud cases where you have uh, people that are being defrauded because of their vulnerability. Uh, uh, the restraint of victim comes up in some robbery situations, but, but not terribly much. And I don't think that official victim or terrorism are used uh, hardly at all. In our scenario, did we have restraint of victim? Okay. Now, how many think, just off the top of your head, that you would add the additional two offense level increase here? Your initial thinking should be, yep, I'm getting ready to add this. However, if the Chapter 2 guideline you have gotten through using, and again, we don't know which Chapter 2 guideline you started with, but if the one you did use has taken this factor into consideration, then do not add it a second time. It's an attempt by the commission to have you not what some refer to as double count. Basically, the commission's position has been, unless we tell you to do otherwise, assume as you go through guideline application, probably you're going to be giving these things. So if we didn't have the application note here saying, don't give restraint a victim as chapter two did it, you probably should make the assumption the commission intended for you to give it back there at chapter two and to give it again here. That has been the basic approach, although again, the case law is headed in a somewhat different direction. Chapter three, part B, role in the offense. It, it has aggravating role, which can add four, three, or two additional offense levels. Mitigating role, which can reduce the offense levels. Abuse of position of trust or use of a skill, which can increase the offense level or using a minor to commit the offense adds additional offense levels as well. Okay, the obstruction adjustments in Chapter 3 at Part C. Uh, there's one for obstructing or impeding the administration of justice. Uh, the other is for reckless endangerment during flight. Obstruction can be obstructing both the investigation, the prosecution, and the sentencing. So there are a lot of things that could occur that would give this two offense level increase that occur after the offense is well over with. Uh, the, the defendant could be coming in giving some kind of material false information to the probation officer uh, in some investigation for the court, and that could trigger that. Uh, or the defendant uh, could, at trial, uh, essentially commit perjury, uh, and the court make the determination there was obstruction occurring in that regard. So uh, there are things that can happen beyond the offense itself uh, that could trigger this obstruction increase. The reckless endangerment during flight, uh, that characteristic occurs, uh, I think, most often in relation to immigration cases where people are coming across the border and there are these high-speed chases and there's a reckless endangerment that occurs. Acceptance of responsibility, Chapter 3, Part E, and that provides for a two offense level reduction if the defendant clearly demonstrates affirmative acceptance of responsibility for the offense. It does not require that an individual plead guilty to get acceptance of responsibility and get the two levels off. Uh, however, it can't be one of these last-minute sort of conversions where the defense says, oh, now I'm convicted, I'd like to get two more levels off. The commission says that it should be viewed from the position as to what has this defendant done up until the time of trial in terms of behavior that would uh, manifest acceptance. If two levels are given, and only if the two levels have been given, then there's a potential third level off if you're at offense level 16 or higher, in other words, coming down this table, if you're 16 or further down on the table, uh, then it's potentially a third level off. 
Uh, that one it re requires a couple of different ways. The one that happens most often, we find, is that if the defendant early on will come in and save the government resources of preparing for trial, save the court the resources of docketing and whatnot for trial, and the defendant comes in and says, I'm going to plead guilty, then the defendant, having been given the two, can get the third. Uh, or the other way is for the defendant, having received the two, to come in, give total, complete information to the government regarding the offense, and that also can provide a basis for the defendant to receive that, that increase or decrease. Welcome back. Rusty, as we've seen, the first segment has focused primarily on just getting started with basic application. Right. What would you think is an important principle to remember when we're just getting started, especially with reference to Appendix A? Well, I think that Appendix A really does represent a principle that is going on in guidelines application, and that is that the guidelines begin as an offense of conviction system. Uh, that truly is, is the way they operate. Uh, policy decision by the commission when they first wrote these guidelines, that they would begin as an offense of conviction system. So this goes all the way back to the beginning uh, of guidelines. Uh, and an example would be that you have an individual who's, say, committed what is referred to as a schoolhouse count by trafficking drugs in a protected location, and he's convicted of the offense of 21860. Uh, the applicable guideline for that offense of conviction is 2D1.2. Another individual is convicted of a drug trafficking offense, uh, but not the schoolhouse count, rather the uh, 21841 violation. Uh, the applicable guideline for that offense of conviction is 2D1.1. Uh, so you go to two different guidelines, even though the individual who was convicted of the 841 violation may have actually been selling those drugs in the protected location. Uh, so, so it's very, uh, very definite as to the outcome based on the offense of conviction. Uh, now, the commission, uh, as you saw in the videotape and as if you've seen any of our training in the past, we've always emphasized uh, that it is an offensive conviction system. Uh, but we found that in some instances, courts were trying to look more to the real offense conduct and trying to go to a guideline based on that real offense conduct rather than the offensive conviction. So this past fall in the most recent amendment cycle, uh, the commission amended 1B1.2 uh, to further clarify and to reiterate that it is an offensive conviction system. Uh, now, uh, I know that we want to make a couple of additional points uh, about guideline application, and I want to use my same scenario to do that. Uh, you have the individual who's convicted of 21860, uh, the schoolhouse count, using guideline 2D1.2. You have the individual convicted of the offense of drug trafficking under 841 uh, using guideline 2D1.1. Uh, in both of those instances, uh, the individual used a minor to commit the offense. Uh, what will you want to remember specifically when you get to your Chapter 3 adjustments, Rachel? Well, Rusty, one of the most important things to remember when you're applying the guidelines is that you need to read everything, not only the entire guideline, but also all of the application notes as well as the introductory commentary and any background commentary that's pertinent. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, in, in the case that you just gave us, when you're applying the drug trafficking guideline at 2D1.1 and the facts suggest, as ours do, that the defendant used a minor to commit a crime, when you come to Chapter 3 adjustments, you're going to want to apply and give an enhancement to that defendant for using that minor at 3B1.4. Right. However, on the other hand, when you're applying the guidelines for the defendant who's convicted of the schoolhouse count and you're at 2D1.2, when you get to chapter three and that using a minor to commit a crime adjustment, we have a specific application note, application note two, which instructs you that if your chapter two guideline incorporates that behavior, then you don't want to apply that adjustment. So there's, there's a perfect example of how it's important that you make sure you read everything, all the application notes, the entire guideline, all of it, so that you don't have a misapplication of the guidelines. Yeah. And, and so often on uh, even helpline calls when people called into the Sentencing Commission, uh, we find that they just haven't actually read uh, the commentary application notes uh, that right. may have answered the question for them. That's right. Okay, Rusty, what are we going to see next in, in our videotape? Well, of course, up to this point, we've been looking at how you establish the offense level, which brings you down the sentencing table. Uh, now we're going to move to looking to establishing the criminal history category, which sends you across the sentencing table. And then those two things in conjunction with each other give you the two axes uh, that give you your applicable guideline range. And so that's what we're going to be looking at in our next segment. And then when we come back from that segment, uh, we're going to start taking the questions that individuals have for us. So if you have those questions, you know, please start faxing those in to us. 
So uh, now I guess we go to the videotape. One of the things about criminal history is there are a lot of rules. It does get pretty complicated pretty fast on you. There's rules and there's exceptions to the rules, but you're always driving to the sentencing table as we talked before, the criminal history category going one through six, and those little numbers in paren, zero or one, criminal history category one, two or three, and so forth, are criminal history points. They're not necessarily uh, the number of convictions. These are points that are uh, accumulated uh, via chapter four under the criminal history rules. And you get these points based on uh, prior sentences, based on uh, the defendant's status. Also, this idea of recency. You just got out of prison fairly recently and you're sort of, the defendant's sort of back at it again. We're saying you're gonna get extra points. The defendant's gonna get extra points under this idea of recency. And you'll see some types of offenses that are never counted. For example, foreign sentences, uh, tribal court sentences, uh, court martials, even juvenile status offenses, for example. Now, under the guidelines, juvenile convictions are countable, potentially, but not juvenile status offenses. You know, possession of alcohol by a minor would be an example of a juvenile status offense. And it works like this. You get three points if the sentence is greater than 13 months, two points if it's greater than 60 days or equal to 60 days up to 13 months and one point for all others. And you'll see this time period. So if you have a, a three-pointer, you got a two-year prison sentence, it's a three-pointer, you have a time period. It has to be within 15 years of the sentence and you'll see a notation imposition or release. What that means, you, you look at when that offense occurred and then count back 15 years. And if that prior sentence occurred within that 15 years, you're going to meet the requirements of that time period. If that prior sentence occurs before that 15-year period and the defendant got a prison sentence and was released within that 15-year time period, it's also countable. Okay, these time periods are important to keep in mind. So this is for prior offenses committed at 18 or older. These are adult um, prior sentences. And I'm, as I mentioned earlier, you also count sentences that occurred before uh, age 18, and it's a little bit different. Here you get, you get a three-pointer if uh, only if convicted as an adult, and the sentence has to be greater than 13 months, and it's the time period is within 15 years of the sentence, imposition, or release. A two-pointer for greater or equal to 60 days up to 13 months. You have a time period there within five years, and a one-pointer for all others. Now, there's some other important determinations you sort of have to be mindful of as you do the criminal history rules, and we can't point them all out for you, but the key ones, especially for you new folks, the key ones to be looking at is the relationship of prior sentences and uh, relevant conduct. Under 4A1.2A1, it says the term prior sentence means any sentence previously imposed upon adjudication of guilt for conduct not part of the instant offense. If you had a drug case, for example, where you had relevant conduct from a prior sentence being included in, in the current offense conduct, okay, you're gonna include that in the offense and not count it as, prior, as a prior sentence. It gets a little complicated, but you know, on that point, but the basic rule is if it's part of the instant offense, if you pulled that conduct out of a state sentence and put it into the, the, the current offense to do the guideline calculation, you're going to include it um, as, uh, you're not going to include it as a, a prior uh, sentence. The other point is uh, related prior cases. Related cases are treated as one sentence for purpose of the criminal history calculation. On page 293 of the guidelines manual, 4A1.2A2 says prior sentences imposed in unrelated cases are to be counted separately, and prior sentences imposed in related cases are uh, treated as one sentence, for, one sentence for purposes of uh, 4A1.1. If, if a defendant comes in for a, a sent, uh, in a prior sentence, and there's two or three cases all sentenced on the same day, for example, they, they could be sort of grouped together, you know, into one sentence and, and have one set of criminal uh, history points for that uh, prior sentence. So. You want to be mindful to take a look at related cases. 
The other point you want to be mindful of are prior revocations of supervision. Sort of like the question, well, how do, how do the guidelines treat a, a prior sentence where there was also a, a probation sentence where then the probation got violated and the defendant got sentenced to an imprisonment term? How's that calculated? Basically, the rule is, in general, you sort of lump those two together. Pardons and set-asides will be counted under the guidelines, but not expunged convictions. And uh, also various other rules throughout Chapter 4 that uh, you're going to want to be mindful of. The, the two key ones we talked about, the status under 4A1.1D, two points are added if the defendant committed the instant offense while under any criminal justice sentence counted under A, B, or C. That, that's the, the key one. And then this recency factor is also one you're going to be mindful of. And that is two points added if the defendant committed the instant offense less than two years after release, but you'd only give one point for 4A1.1E if you've also had uh, status. What we're talking about for overrides is you go through the and do your criminal history calculation, and no matter what the criminal history points are, it can potentially be overridden by a few of these special rules that uh, nowhere in the book do we call them overrides, I don't think, but us in the training department thought, you know what, you need a marker, so we're calling them overrides. And that is uh, 3A1.4 for uh, terrorism. Career offender, and this is one that comes into play probably more than any of these overrides. The criminal livelihood in 4B1.3 that you're not going to see too much of. Um, and then in 4B1.4, this armed career criminal. For the career offender, we're talking about someone who's at least 18 at the time of the instant offense. The instant offense is a, is a felony crime of violence or controlled substance and the defendant has at least two prior felony convictions of either a crime of violence or a controlled substance offense. And what Congress has basically said under the statute, for those kinds of people, these repeat violent drug type offenders, make sure you sentence those kind of folks toward the statutory maximum. And hence, that's why we have this career offender. And also, offense level determined by a table based on the statutory maximum, unless the offense level from chapters two and three is greater. And so you have this special table involving the statutory maximum and the offense levels. Like in our robbery scenario, if we had, I think the statutory maximum would be 25 years for our robbery, it's uh, automatically going to be, if you have a career offender, uh, an offense level of 34 less the acceptance of responsibility. Uh, also, you get that reduction before sentencing if, if acceptance applies. You notice that on that table, if you're a career offender, we give you a set number, and that number can be reduced if you gave acceptance or responsibility. Some people believe, they say, oh, well, then we also had, say, maybe a minor role or minimal role. Can we subtract that from this as well? Well, guideline application is sequential, and, and we try and have the worksheets to emphasize that, that you start, you know, chapter two, you work through three, you're working your way through the book. By the time you get to chapter four, you've already passed all those adjustments in chapter three to include acceptance and responsibility, but you've passed role and acceptance and all those other things. When you get over to chapter four, it is only because under the career offender guideline that we say this number can be reduced if you did give acceptance and responsibility back in chapter three. It's only because the commission says that that authorizes those three levels to be taken off. So even though you may have, in your sequence of application, you may have given, say, a minimal role reduction, when you get over to, to career offender, the individual cannot get those offense levels off at that point because you have worked past that. Only if the commission were to come in and change the career offender guidelines saying, oh, you can also reduce it if you gave career offender back in chapter, if you gave mitigating role back in chapter three also. So keep that in mind. Once you've calculated down uh, the table, chapters two and three, across the table, chapter four, uh, the overrides in Chapter 4, Part B, for, for the, the points Frank was talking about, whether you come further down or further across, then you have to put the table into effect. And that is back in Chapter 5. And we're going to look at the table, the zones, and some other aspects of that. The sentencing table. We have the zones A, B, C, and D. And those zones provide for certain things for the court to do still within the guidelines. It's not a departure to do these things that are offered within a particular zone. Let's talk about what these zones offer. 
Under zone A, the minimum of any of those ranges, the minimum of all those ranges, is zero. And so what could be done to a defendant who comes in with a zero to six range? Well, within guideline sentence, it would not be a departure just to give that defendant a fine. That would be acceptable under the guidelines to have fined that defendant, because the range calls from anywhere from no imprisonment up to six months of imprisonment. Straight probation would be available. So you don't have to give any imprisonment, because the range doesn't call for any imprisonment. That would be acceptable. Or, of course, the defendant could get a term of imprisonment. And within the guidelines, without departing, the court could give up to six months of imprisonment and still be within our guidelines. Zone B, you're coming down the table, you see the minimum of these ranges. There's a number there. There's a positive number. You could give probation, but here, since there was a number called for at the very minimum of a range, the requirement is that in giving the probation, there has to be a special condition of the probation. And the condition of the probation is that while the defendant will not be going to prison for, say, the minimum of the range for being four months, he's not going to go to prison for four months, still that defendant is going to lose certain uh, uh, liberties by way of a condition of either home detention, community confinement, or intermittent confinement. It's going to be actually a sort of a substitute for having given the guy four months of imprisonment. You put him on probation, four months of home detention. Put him on probation, four months in a halfway house. Put him on probation, four months in a residential drug treatment facility. All those would be acceptable guideline sentences within that range. Another sentence that uh, sometimes is referred to as sort of a shock incarceration sentence is where you use imprisonment, even though the range, you know, in the range calls for imprisonment, four to ten, for instance. Uh, but you don't give the full minimum. You don't give the full four months. Uh, rather, under this option, you have to give at least one month. So you have a range of four to ten, and the court could utilize the option of saying, well, I'm giving you one month of imprisonment. And having given one month of imprisonment, it looks like three are still owing in terms of the minimum of the range. And to satisfy those other three months, uh, the court can't put this guy on probation now because the statute doesn't allow giving imprisonment and probation. But having given imprisonment, the court is authorized to give a term of, as Frank mentioned earlier, supervised release to follow the term of imprisonment. So the court says one month of imprisonment, say three years of supervised release. Special condition of your supervised release while you're under the supervision, these three months that are owing will be satisfied by a special condition of home detention or community confinement. And that would satisfy the range as well. Zone C, and as you see, as you go down the table, the, the guidelines are more restrictive in terms of these options. These numbers at the minimum are much larger numbers, as you see. The least uh, severe of the options allows for what sometimes is referred to as a split sentence. Not to be confused with what years ago was called the old split sentence, but this type of split sentence is you've got a range, say, 8 to 14 months. Well, you can split that minimum term, that eight months of imprisonment, and require just half of that of imprisonment. So the court could give, say, four months of imprisonment. Again, only four months have been given, so apparently the other four have to be satisfied somehow. That would be satisfied by supervised release to follow the imprisonment with a special condition of the supervised release that the remaining four months be a condition of home detention or community confinement. And again, that would be within guideline range acceptable sentence or a term of imprisonment. You get a range of eight to, eight to 14 months, the court could give a term of imprisonment of somewhere between eight and 14 months. It could choose a number in between. We don't have a, uh, uh, a zone showing zone D. There are no options available under zone D. You have someone say under zone D, and the court puts that person on probation or splits the sentence up or whatever, uh, that's going to be a departure. Uh, the courts, in some instances, may decide to be creative and to depart and utilize that type of sentence, but it would, be, it would be a departure. It's not something that the guidelines permit. The commission envisions that at the, range, at the zones under Zone D, at those ranges, a uh, defendant will receive a term of imprisonment within that range unless there is the reason to depart. As far as other aspects of sentence, probation, you know, when probation should be given, when it could be given. They talk about supervised release, when it should be given, how much should be given, the length of supervised release that should be given. Restitution, fines, assessments, and forfeitures, all that is addressed likewise. Sentencing options, you know, what about the court if it wants to use, say, uh, a community service? Can that be utilized? Uh, some of those things of that nature are discussed as well. Uh, and undischarged terms of imprisonment. You may have a defendant coming in to be sentenced in federal court, and you've calculated this guideline range, and the court's getting ready to impose this sentence, either within the guidelines or departure. But this defendant may also currently be serving, say, a state term of imprisonment or another federal sentence. 
Uh, and the question is, well, is this federal sentence that we're getting ready to give going to be concurrent or consecutive to that sentence that is already being served? And that's addressed back in Chapter 5 as well, 5, 5G. Congress, when they had the Sentencing Reform Act, I think initially the plan was that no statute, no criminal violation, would even have a term of imprisonment listed under a particular section. Rather, it was just going to be classified, like this is a Class B felony or Class C, and then there'd be a, a table somewhere that would say, this is how much imprisonment these people can get for this kind of violation. It never sort of worked out that way. Rather, what, what uh, occurs is that based on what is the maximum statutory penalty for the offense that the defendant's convicted of in federal court, it then translates into a class of offense. So our armed bank robbers facing a maximum statutory penalty of 25 years. Because 25 years is the maximum statutory penalty, that makes this a class B felony. By this table, once you determine the classification of your offense, I think you'll find helpful in letting you know whether by statute probation is available or not, and upon violation of the probation and subsequent revocation of the probation, how much time could be given. For instance, this class B felon that we have, our, our armed bank robber being a class B felon, the tr authorized term of probation, probation is not authorized by statute for a person who is an armed bank robber. The class B felon, you're not going to get that. Uh, we have over there, and it may be a little confusing to you, where we have the maximum statutory penalty for the offense is what's available upon revocation of probation. You're saying, well, if he couldn't get probation, how's he going to have some penalty available when it's revoked? Because he wasn't going to get it to start with. Well, uh, there is always the possibility, uh, and I think this varies from circuit to circuit, that maybe through cooperation, I know Frank talked a little bit about that earlier, substantial assistance with the government, uh, that the court somehow ends up giving a probation sentence that would not otherwise be authorized by statute because of the cooperation. Based on the class of the felony, uh, there are set terms of supervised release allowed. Uh, for instance, our defendant was convicted of a class B felony, uh, and a class B felony by statute you can get up to five years of supervised release to follow this term of imprisonment the court is going to order. Uh, upon violation and subsequent revocation of the supervised release, the defendant could face potentially up to three years of imprisonment. But say the court, for whatever reason, in, in the, a robbery case, armed robbery, gave 25 years of imprisonment. The defendant went off and served in every day of the 25 years of imprisonment. The court could have also given it in the time of sentencing, in addition to the 25 years, this five-year term of supervised release. And having served the 25, when the guy comes out and is under supervision by some U.S. probation officer that's not in this audience, uh, then the, that defendant is going to be on supervision, if, and if violating, uh, will be taken back and potentially could face three more years of imprisonment. So it's a total of 28 years that could result in custody from this conviction uh, for this armed bank robbery. Just one other point I want to make is about our fine table uh, back in Chapter 5. Uh, here you've done the calculations in a particular case, and you've decided based on the offense level, you know, in criminal history category, the guideline range. Also, the offense level that is ultimately used in the calculation uh, leads to a table that, that establishes the range of imprisonment. Our case at hand was, uh, what was the offense level for our robber? 20 what? 29. 29. So, so this table would say this defendant, with assuming ability to pay, would have a fine of between $15,000 and $150,000. Hello there, and welcome back. You have seen the first two segments of our program, and you're probably um, looking forward to a stretch break. So what we'll do is give you a five-minute stretch break, which will provide good opportunity for you to fax in your questions for us. I'm sure you'll have quite a few right now. Let me give you the fax number. It's 1-800-488-0397. So we'll see you back in five minutes, and then we'll have our question and answer period.
Hey, welcome back. Well, I think we're ready to uh, answer some of your questions. Uh, Rachel, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Uh, Nancy, do we have any questions? Oh, yes, Rusty. We do have some questions. Oh, good. And in fact, I'm going to ask you the first question. I'm ready, I, I think. Okay. Under the uh, Sentencing Reform Act, how much good time can an inmate receive towards service of a sentence? Uh, good time. Uh, good time is available only for sentences of over one year, and it's not available for sentences of a year of, of life. Uh, which means that if an individual gets a life sentence, uh, since we have no parole in our system, it's a true life sentence. Now, in terms of not being available for a sentence of a year or less, if an individual were to receive uh, a sentence of less than a year or a year, uh, that individual would not be eligible for any good time. And so it's advantageous to the defendant to receive a sentence of, say, a year and a day instead of a one-year sentence. Now, the amount of good time that's available is up to 15 percent, uh, which translates roughly into 54 days for every year of good time that is served. So you serve one year of good time, 54 days comes off the back end. So I wouldn't be happy if I received 11 months as uh, far as the sentence was concerned? You probably wouldn't be happy if you received anything, Nancy, that's but true. certainly if you weren't going to get your good time. Thank you. Can an acceptance, and I do have a question for Rachel. Can an acceptance of responsibility adjustment be given to a defendant who goes to a trial? Uh, yes, Nancy, an acceptance of responsibility adjustment can be given to a defendant who goes to trial, although the guidelines do say that this will be a rare case. Um, for example, if, if a defendant goes to trial for some reason, say, not related to uh, factual guilt, such as a constitutional challenge or something like that, um, the adjustment can be given to that defendant. What the court is going to need to do is look to the conduct of the defendant prior to the trial in order to determine whether or not that defendant is going to be eligible for that uh, two-level reduction. Okay, very good. Rusty, next question. Do you have to apply a cross-reference? Uh, yes, uh, cross-references are required, assuming that the, uh, the facts support the application of the cross-reference. Cross-reference operates just like anything else in the guidelines. If the facts support it, uh, then it has to be given. It's not something that's optional. Uh, and in terms of uh, what the Commission has found in, in case reviews of, of certain kinds of cases on occasions, it, it looks like that uh, the facts would probably have supported the application of the cross-reference, and the courts are not giving those. So uh, it's very critical to remember that a cross-reference is not something that's just optional. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Rachel, we do have another question, and we're obviously taking turns here. How do you handle a defendant who violates his or her probation or supervised release? Okay, violations and revocations. Uh, Rusty actually did mention that briefly, a classification of offenses and what sort of uh, penalties are available for uh, revocation in the broadcast. However, because that's such a, a heavy topic, we're not really going to get into it much today. Um, I do want to direct the viewers, if they have questions about that, um, to Chapter 7 of our Guidelines Manual, which is where you're going to find the policy statements regarding violations and revocations, and also to our website. Uh, we do have a document on the website titled Probation and Supervised Release Violations. There's a lot of helpful information in that document, as well as some case law uh, with pertinent uh, issues uh, for violations and revocations. Our website is www.ussc.gov. Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. And remember, there is time for you to be faxing in your questions. And again, our fax number is 1-800-488-0397. Uh, we have uh, time for one more question, Rusty, before we begin our okay. next segment. Does the amount of time served have an impact on the number of criminal history points assigned to a sentence? Uh, actually, it, the time served does not. Uh, the way our criminal history points operate is that you look to the sentence that was imposed. In other words, what did the judge articulate at the sentencing? Not how much time was actually served by the defendant. So the judge may have said uh, a five-year sentence, but the individual served less than a year. Uh, it still is a five-year sentence. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, however, is that if the court suspended a portion of the sentence, they gave five years upon service of one year. Uh, that one-year service, that one-year sentence, it was suspended too, even though maybe even that full one year was not served, would still be the sentence in, in that set of facts. Okay, very good, Rusty. Uh, Rachel, um, why don't you just tell us what's going to happen in the next segment? Sure, Nancy. Uh, the next segment of our broadcast is going to focus on the application of relevant conduct. 
The videotape will begin with a brief discussion of the drug trafficking guideline, which is probably one of the most frequently used guidelines. Uh, then we are going to get into a more in-depth discussion of relevant conduct. Let's go ahead and take a look at our next segment. Just to show you how the drug guideline uh, works, you have a base offense level. It tells you to apply the greatest of uh, three different things. Number one is uh, defendants convicted under certain statutes if death, serious injury from drug use occurs, there's a similar prior conviction, you can end up as a base offense level 43. Or number two, defendant convicted under certain statutes and death or serious bodily injury resulted from the drug use, you could be at a 38. And I dare say most of all the cases that come through 2D1.1 are down here, this base offense level from the drug quantity table. And anybody's had a case, as I'm sure, uh, looked at this drug quantity table before. It's kind of, you know, the, it's sort of like a, almost like a sliding scale. It depends on the amount of drugs involved in the case, and that determines the base offense level. You can see we have an example up here of drug quantity table base offense levels for powder cocaine. 500 grams of powder cocaine is an offense level of 26. Less than 25 grams of powder cocaine can be a down to an offense level 12. If a firearm or a dangerous weapon was possessed, you could end up with a two offense level increase. If the defendant imported or exported uh, drugs using an aircraft or was a pilot, captain, and so forth, you could get a two level increase. And if that occurs, you also have a floor in 2D1.1 of an offense level 26. Distribution in prison can add two offense levels. Importation of methamphetamine or manufacture of methamphetamine from listed chemicals, and if the defendant's role is not mitigating under 3B1.2, then it can be a two offense level increase. Environmental hazards, that could be a two level increase. If the defendant meets the criteria for the safety valve and the offense level is a 26 or greater, as you're doing 2D1.1, you can put, the defendant can end up getting potentially two levels off. And cross-references, C1, if the victim was murdered, apply the guideline for first degree murder, or if the defendant is convicted under 841B7, distribution with intent to commit a crime of violence, apply the guideline for attempt to that offense if greater. Relevant conduct. You really have to understand relevant conduct because that is really sort of the cornerstone of guideline application. I uh, can't emphasize it. So I've said the worksheets, now I'm saying relevant conduct. There may be one more, but relevant conduct is extremely important to understand. Relevant conduct sets the limits of information to be used in guidelines application. You have all this universe of information that uh, can potentially come into play in terms of sentencing, and relevant conduct guidelines are going to tell the judge gonna, and uh, what's going to be considered, how it's going to factor into the guidelines, or how it may not be factored into the guidelines, could be potentially excluded from the guidelines. Include certain acts of the defendant, what the defendant did, and potentially what other people did in connection with this offense that occurred within certain time limitations. Relevant conduct is all about sentencing accountability as opposed to what might be considered criminal liability. And Information that can be used at sentencing generally is all information under the statute 3661. You'll see that the guidelines at 1B1.4 and the Supreme Court, even in the, these two cases, the Witt case and the Watts case, talk about that. But the guidelines, information that can be used in applying the guidelines, is spelled out by relevant conduct and has to fall within the limits set by relevant conduct. Relevant conduct is broken down, as you will see if you're looking in your manual, into subsection little a and into subsection little b. Now, subsection little a tells us what is going to be relevant for application of chapters 2 and 3. And, you know, this doesn't come as a shock to anyone when I say chapters 2 and 3, because we've looked at the chapter 2 guidelines, the chapter 3 adjustments, you know what we're talking about. Subsection b is well, what's going to be relevant for application of chapters 4 and 5. We're showing 1B1.3, sub little a, sub little b. Little a is broken down into 1, 2, 3, and 4. Sub b doesn't have any further breakdown. Under little a, we don't really find a whole lot of issues arising, a lot of calls, a lot of questions, a lot of even case law that deals with subsections 3 and 4. If you have a question on subsection 
A3, A4, give us a call on the helpline. We'll, we'll, we'll be glad to talk to you about it, but it's not something that we feel we need to emphasize here. A1 and A2, that's where the issues come up, and that's, I think, the essence of when people talk about relevant conduct. Uh, I think that's the essence of it. So let's look at A1, and I think it's probably a little easier to look at it from the when to start with. The when is like, okay, we know there's a universe of information, we know it goes from the beginning of time up to now, but what are we going to get to look at for sentencing purposes? Well, the when is like, okay, here's how far you can go looking at time uh, in, in applying the guideline. First of all, it's key to the offense of conviction. What is your offense of conviction? And we had this morning was an armed bank robber. That's our offense of conviction. Now we're going to look at the when, the time component, sometimes referred to as the temporal component. The commission says, hmm, something occurred during the offense of conviction, and that seems to be pretty closely uh, in nexus with the offense of conviction, so that's going to be part of our temporal consideration. But we're going to go a little broader than just those things that occurred during the offense of conviction. We also will look at those things that occurred in preparation for the offense of conviction. That's closely enough associated with the offense of conviction that if something was done in preparation, even though it may have occurred before the offense of conviction, that it's still going to be within our temporal consideration for relevant conduct. And also, we're going to consider those things that occurred in avoiding detection or responsibility for the offense of conviction. And those things may be occurring even after the offense of conviction, but there's some attempt to avoid detection or responsibility. Still, temporally, it's expanded a little bit, but there's still this nexus, this connection with our offense of conviction. Now, under A1, the who is going to be everything the defendant did. As we have... Uh, you know, a lot more legalistic type language. We say if the defendant committed an act, or if the defendant aided an act, or abetted it, or counseled it, commanded it, induced it, procured it, willfully caused it. But basically, it's like, did the defendant do it? But we're also going, in some instances, look at the acts of others. Now, the acts of others, we require a further analysis to occur, and this we refer to it as our three-part analysis. First, you have to determine the scope of the defendant's jointly undertaken activity. And then you have to make the determination, well, these acts of others, were they in furtherance of this undertaking my defendant was engaged in? Would a reasonable person have foreseen that engaging in undertaking with other people, that they may have done these kinds of acts in furtherance of this undertaking? The defendant committed the robbery, okay? So now we're asking about this, the specific offense characteristics of Chapter 2 consideration. We know A1 covers Chapter 2 consideration. And the question is, was a firearm possessed? Well, the analysis is this act occurred during the offense of conviction. He possessed the gun during the offense of conviction. It was an act that was committed by the defendant. The defendant did it during the offense of conviction. It's relevant. Yes, when the guideline says give five offense level increase, you have relevant conduct of a firearm being possessed by the defendant. You give the five offense level increase. But say our defendant did rob this bank with others, and our defendant didn't carry the gun. The other guy carried the gun. When the offense level increase says give five levels if a firearm was possessed, is our defendant going to get that or not? The three-step analysis. Was our defendant engaged in jointly undertaking activity with this other person? And what was that scope? Well, the undertaking, undertaking that our defendant had was the robbery. Was this act of this other person, this act we're looking at, the carrying of the gun, was that in furtherance of this robbery? Hmm, he did point it at the tellers, and they did, did seem to give money a lot more quickly when he did so. Seems to have been in furtherance of the undertaking. And then finally, would a reasonable person who has undertaken a robbery with someone else have foreseen that someone may have used a weapon during a crime of violence? And we have to answer that as well in the affirmative. If so, then even though it's an act of someone else, it is relevant conduct, and being relevant conduct, the defendant's held accountable for it. This defendant and that defendant, they robbed a bank together. Hmm, what was the scope of the conspiracy? Well, the scope of the conspiracy was to rob the bank. Sometimes the conspiracy and what the defendant has undertaken are mirror images of each other. They are one and the same, but that is not always the case. The scope of the criminal activity jointly undertaken by the defendant is not necessarily the same as the scope of the entire conspiracy. The examples would be uh, the defendant is, is convicted of a conspiracy count, uh, and the conspiracy count has your defendant and 100 other people engaged in a conspiracy to import drugs on 100 different occasions into the country. Well, your defendant is criminally responsible, criminally liable for this conspiracy, having been convicted of it. But for sentencing purposes, we say, well, what this defendant undertook may not be the same as this entire conspiracy. 
and you have to look at the facts and say, well, this defendant's undertaking actually was the importation of drugs on three occasions. Out of those hundreds of importations, this defendant was engaged in three of those. You have narrowed down from this entire conspiracy the, the undertaking of this particular defendant. Reasonably foreseeable. Uh, we have that language about reasonably foreseeable. Reasonably foreseeable is the language in our three-step analysis, three-part analysis for holding the defendant accountable for the acts of others. As such, reasonable foreseeability applies only to the conduct of others. It does not apply to the acts of the defendant. For instance, the defendant's convicted, say, of the conspiracy. And the act of the defendant in the conspiracy was the defendant brought in the bag of drugs that contained two kilos of heroin. Well, turns out the defendant says, gosh, I had no idea I was bringing in heroin. I thought it was cocaine. And I didn't realize it was two kilos. It felt like about a kilo and a half to me, you know. And the question is, well, gee, would that have been reasonably foreseeable to the defendant that he was carrying heroin instead of cocaine and that it was two kilos instead of a half kilo? You don't even have to go there. Because if the defendant did it and it occurred during the offense of conviction, the defendant's responsible for that. So reasonable foreseeability isn't something we're looking at in regard to the acts of the defendant. That's when we're looking at the acts of others. And as we look at the acts of others, keep in mind, it's only one part of the three-part analysis of looking at the acts of others. For instance, the defendant, out of these 100 importations with these hundreds of people over this long period of time, undertook three of those importations. Well, he undertook three of the importations with some of those hundreds of people. And, it, and he did it maybe early on in this big conspiracy. Hey, probably should have been reasonably foreseeable that some of those people might have gone on and imported drugs on other occasions in the conspiracy. Might have been known to him after his three importations that others went on and imported drugs again. They may have dropped by and said, boy, you need to come on out there, help us import some more drugs here. You know, you did it three times and sort of we haven't seen you around lately. Come on down. Uh, you know, maybe he knows about it. It's not only reasonably foreseeable, it's known. But that's not the analysis. The analysis is you say, what was the scope of the defendant's undertaking? The undertaking of the defendant out of this conspiracy was the three importations. So even if something is known to the defendant or reasonably foreseeable, if it's not within the scope of the defendant's undertaking, it is not going to be relevant conduct. A2 we refer to as expanded relevant conduct. When we have this expanded relevant conduct under A2, we're not expanding the acts of the defendant because we, we know that we look at the, the, who, the who or the acts of the defendant and the acts of the others under the three-part analysis. So we're not expanding the who. We are expanding rather the, the when, the temporal component. And what we're expanding is only for certain kinds of offenses. Drug trafficking, fraud, theft, money laundering, firearms offenses, counterfeiting, alien smuggling, tax violations, antitrust violations. A lot of offenses are listed back there. You're probably talking in excess of about 80% of all your cases are going to have expanded relevant conduct. So this is not something that happens infrequently. It's all those acts that were part of the same course of conduct our common scheme or plan as the offense of conviction. Hmm, my defendant came in, pled guilty to one count, selling drugs on one street corner on one occasion. That's the offense of conviction. A1 of relevant conduct kept us locked in to all those things that occurred during that sale and preparation for that sale, avoiding detection. Acts of the defendant and acts of others. Uh, but, oh, this is one of those for which relevant conduct is expanded. Now I'm not looking just at that offense of conviction for my time frame, the when, I'm looking at the course of conduct or common scheme or plan of which this offense of conviction is part. You say, gosh, the course of conduct was this defendant sold drugs on the street corner 52 weeks, a kilo at a time. So now you're looking at all that course of conduct, common scheme or plan, and saying, okay, everything the defendant did during that course of conduct, common scheme or plan, are the acts of others under the three-part analysis in that course of conduct, common scheme or plan. Suddenly, from pleading guilty to one count for which one kilo of drugs was involved, you're looking at 52 kilos, or however many kilos were involved in all these transactions. So relevant conduct is expanded tremendously for these kinds of offenses. There's a listing at, also at 3D1.2D of offenses for which you will not use this expanded relevant conduct. And included there are essentially offenses against the person uh, that are more or less like the crimes of violence. Uh, robbery, assault, murder, kidnapping, criminal sexual assault, extortion, and burglary. Those kinds of offenses are listed. One final point, uh, we know with uh, uh, our time frames, and I uh, don't want to get you too confused on terminology, but the time frames on criminal history. You know, you go back the five years, the 10 years, the 15 years to count the prior sentences when you're looking at a guy's prior record. Well, you're going back five years, 10 years, 15 years from when? From the earliest date of relevant conduct. 
and that can be quite critical in terms of prior criminal record getting counted against a defendant. Because you got the guy coming in for sentencing here today, and the offense this, the defendant committed that was this one sale of drugs on one occasion, that happened a year ago. But this guy had a course of conduct, a common scheme or plan of selling drugs once a week for the last five years. So six years ago is when he started this course of conduct, common scheme or plan. The earliest relevant conduct we looked at for this defendant was six years ago. Well, that being the case, when you're counting back five, 10, 15 years to see, does this guy have any prior sentences that we're going to count? Are they too far out of our time frame? You say, oh, gosh, well, he had one that was like 20 years ago. Hmm, but we're going to count that because six years ago when the relevant conduct began, counting back 15 years from the six years ago, we're going back 21 years. Yes, that 21 year, that 20 year ago sentence gets counted against this defendant. So the defendant will be moving across the sentencing table in terms of the criminal history category for things that will get brought in there. Welcome back again. As we looked at the video there, it gave us a brief uh, view of the drug trafficking guideline at 2D1.1. You know, typically when you look at the drug trafficking guideline or begin discussing uh, sentences under drug uh, statutes, the issue will lead to the, 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 to the discussion of how do you determine statutory penalties for drug offenses, both mandatory, mandatory minimum penalties and statutory maximum penalties. And certainly interest in those areas uh, has been increased tremendously since the Apprendi versus New Jersey decision by the U.S. Supreme Court last year. Uh, there the U.S. Supreme Court talked about what is required in order to have an enhanced maximum statutory penalty. Because our video presentation today, however, is focus focusing on basic guidelines application, we will not be getting into the determination of statutory penalties or looking at recent case law developments. But for those of you that are interested in Apprendi, and I'm sure that virtually everyone is, uh, the FJTN did an excellent broadcast just last month that looked at Apprendi. Uh, they did a great job. It had an expert panel that was involved in that uh, to include one of our sentencing commissioners, Judge Joe Kendall from the Northern District of Texas. Uh, so we certainly commend you uh, to, to watching that video. We, we think it's, it's, it's an excellent one. Uh, it will be rebroadcast on a couple of occasions upcoming uh, on the FJTN network. Uh, the first will be on uh, February the 14th. Uh, I assume that that's probably like some kind of FJTN Valentine's Day special. <laughs> and then it'll be shown again on March the 14th. Uh, on each of those dates, it'll be shown at both uh, noon and then again at 1 o'clock. Thank you, Rusty. We're going to move on to our final segment in just a moment. But before we do that, Rusty, um, I just wanted to ask you, what do you think is one of the most important principles to remember when we're applying relevant conduct? Well, I think the main thing, and, and you probably gathered it from the uh, video presentation, uh, was that uh, relevant conduct it has to be done on an individualized determination uh, for each and every defendant that is uh, being sentenced and, the, and the for which the guidelines are being applied. You have to go through this analysis for each and every one. Uh, and that's true even if you have multiple defendants convicted of just the same count of conviction because that relevant conduct may be different for each of those defendants. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that until you have gone through that analysis and that application. Uh, now I know that sometimes uh, if you've done it long enough, uh, it starts seeming maybe a little bit intuitive as, as to the analysis. Uh, but I think uh, always uh, a, a person applying the guidelines would do well to go back to the analysis and be able to articulate where in the analysis they found the relevant conduct to apply or not to apply. Uh, because if an issue is challenged, you have to be able to go back and to justify why you did or did not include something as part of your relevant conduct. Absolutely, very good point. Okay, it's time to move on to our fourth and final segment of the videotape. It's going to focus on multiple count application and we're also going to give you a brief discussion of departures. Remember, if you have any questions, please fax them into us now. Once again, our fax number is 1-800-488-0397. Let's go back to the videotape. Of course, as you're applying guidelines, you've got to use the sentencing table and you've got to come down the table to a certain point and across the table to a certain point to come up with your guideline range. And with multiple counts, of course, one of the practical aspects of it is, hey, well, if I've got multiple counts, what point do I use going down the table? If I've got multiple counts, do I have multiple points? You know, how do I, I've got to have one place that I come down so I can go across from that place to go out to find this one range. And the rationale for the multiple count rules 
One is to determine the single offense level. By using these rules, you will be able to find that one point coming down the table that connects with that one point going across the table that gives you this one guideline range for your multiple counts of conviction. The commission in the multiple count rules is trying to keep from double counting, from punishing a defendant twice through conduct, Willie really, has already been punished under one of the counts of conviction. We don't want to double punish. Uh, also, to provide incremental punishment. If someone, say, comes into court convicted of multiple offenses, uh, oftentimes, people will get multiple punishments for multiple offenses, but typically it is, a, it is an equal amounts of, of punishment. A guy convicted of five robberies probably doesn't get the, the length of time under nine guideline sentencing, uh, five times the time that the guy who committed the one robbery. Rather, it's more of an incremental increase, and our guidelines work to give incremental increases. Yeah, you'll get more time for five robberies than for one, but you're not going to get five times the amount. You're going to get a little bit more for each of the additional what we call harm and to limit prosecutorial impact. If the guidelines said, oh, every time you get a count of conviction, we're going to add so much more offense levels or so much more time or whatever, prosecutors say, well, in this case, you know, I can charge 20 counts of embezzlement. Uh, in this other case, I'll just charge one count of embezzlement. And boy, we came out with a whole lot different sentence here just based on purely the way I decided to charge this conduct. And the commission has tried to limit that somewhat in these multiple count rules. Now, the commission said, we know that when you have multiple counts of conviction, you have multiple violations of law. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's one and the same. You violated the law multiple times with the multiple counts of conviction. But you don't always have what we think are multiple harms in terms of guideline application purposes. Sometimes it is best to look at the multiple counts as really a one composite harm. So sometimes we'll make the decision that even though you have multiple counts of violations, multiple, vi multiple uh, uh, counts of conviction, uh, that you really just have one composite harm. It's best viewed as one composite harm. So the, the approach to multiple counts is not to look so much at the counts, but to look at how many harms do we have really occurring here. And there's several ways which the determination is made as to whether you have a single harm or multiple harms. Now, the grouping rules are the things that we look at to make the decision as to whether we have multiple harms or a single composite harm. You'll hear and even read in, in the case law, these were grouped under Rule A, these were grouped under Rule B. Uh, so so they're, they're referred to as rules, even though it's still just another guideline in the manual. Now, the steps in multiple counts, it, it, I think basically it can be broken down to two steps, and sometimes you don't even have to get to the second step, so I think it's really pretty easy in, in that regard. Step one is grouping. Grouping leads us to the determination as to whether we have one composite harm, even though we've got multiple counts of conviction, one composite harm, or whether we have multiple harms. First, you see grouping counts under Rule D, because we think that's the easiest rule to group under. And if you don't group them under Rule D, how about Rules A, B, or C? Do they work toward grouping? And we'll go through this process. If you have made the determination that you have more than one harm, then just like the five robberies, where we say, well, we're going to give some additional punishment but we're not going to get five times the punishment that we would have for, for one robbery. The process the commission sends you through is called incremental increases in punishment. It's, it's, we refer to it as sort of a unit process where you have to assign what are called units. We'll talk about that. And then these units will translate into additional offense levels, the additional offense levels representing this increase in punishment for these multiple harms. So we got the two steps. And let me explain what the first step is, the process of grouping. Uh, if counts are grouped together, basically we're going to treat them as one composite harm. Uh, obviously, in the alphabet, D comes after A, B, and C. But we have not found anything that, that somehow uh, upsets the application of the guidelines when you get to the multiple count section to use rule D first before you use rules A, B, or C. The reason we suggest grouping under rule D first, if the counts can be grouped under rule D, is that more counts than any other type of, of count are going to fall under this type of uh, rule. And that rule says that if counts use the same or similar guidelines, I got 50 counts of drug trafficking, hmm, they use the same guideline. Each count uses the 2D1.1 drug trafficking guideline. And if that guideline is included at 3D1.2D. In other words, if you go into your guidelines manual to 3D1.2 under Section D and we list the guidelines that are covered there, and drug trafficking is listed there, uh, then you apply the guidelines as if for a single count application. Basically what you do, you add up the quantities of the drugs, you apply the guidelines one time. 
They have been grouped together. They're treated as a composite harm as such, because what you've done, you've looked at the harm from each of the counts by aggregating the quantities. You're giving some consideration for all that harm when you apply the guidelines that one time. I got five counts of fraud. Hmm, each count of fraud, if I look up the statutory violation and go to the uh, Appendix A, I'm sent to the guideline 2F1.1 for each of these counts of conviction. So I know these, these counts of conviction are all using the same guideline in Chapter 2. And I know from going to 3D1.2D, looking at the list, that these gui this guideline I'm using for all these counts is the one that's listed there. So the approach is I aggregate all the monies related to this fraud conduct, apply the fraud guideline one time, and the number I come up with, the offense level, that is a, a number that represents this composite harm. So that's the approach. And again, 80% of your cases, probably better in some districts, are going to be your money laundering, your drug trafficking, your thefts, embezzlements, your frauds, your immigration offenses, counterfeiting, uh, a variety of others are listed there. But these are the ones you're going to see most often. Now, some offenses are excluded from grouping under Rule D. You've got multiple counts of robbery or assault or murder or kidnapping, all these crimes of violence that we talked about.